Hi, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name is Daniel Matura, and I'm the co-chair of CAA Arts Access. I am a graduate of Columbia College, class of 2009. I want to welcome you all to tonight's CAA Arts Access presentation with the Shakespeare Theater of New Jersey for the premiere of A Midsummer Night's Dream. So we have an amazing uh, panel for you that we're going to um, talk about this production. Uh, first off is uh, the artistic team, which uh, starts with Bonnie Monty, who's the artistic director of the Shakespeare Theater of New Jersey. She entered her 30th season as artistic director in 2020. And under her leadership, the theater has evolved into one of the most respected classical theaters in the nation. And it's known as a leader in training emerging young theater professionals. Bonnie has directed over 70 productions for theater from Shakespeare to plays uh, from the Russian canon. And she has a conservatory degree in directing from the Hartman Conservatory and a BA in theater from Bethany College, as well as honorary degrees from Drew University and the College of St. Elizabeth. So we're very happy to have Bonnie here. Uh, next up is Brian Crow, who is the director of education and a resident director at the Shakespeare Theater. And he directed this uh, production of A Midsummer Night's Dream. And he is beginning his 26th season. So we have two uh, amazing experts on, on Shakespeare and the work from, from the theater. Uh, during his tenure with the company, he has directed 27 plays in Shakespeare's canon as well as numerous other plays, including his original works based on the writings of Edgar Allan Poe. Brian holds BFAs in directing and acting from Wright State University and was a fellow at the 2000 International Salzburg Shakespeare Seminar. And then we have two actors from the production. Uh, we have Jeffrey Mark Atkins, uh, Alkins in his third season with the Shakespeare Theater. His company credits include Shakespeare Live 2020, uh, Crazy Love, uh, Shaw, 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 and Romeo and Juliet. Uh, as a classic, classically trained dancer, he's worked with members of Alan Ailey, Alvin Ailey, and Complexions. He's appeared in select off-Broadway, including The Three Musketeers, Me and the Girls, and The Land of Cheesecake and Ice Cream. He's a graduate of St. John's University, the American Academy of Dramatic Arts Full-Time Conservatory, and the New York Academy Company. Last but not least, we have Billy Wyatt, who is also in her third season with the Shakespeare Theater. Her company credits include Shakespeare Live 2019 and 2020, Ken Ludwig's The Three Musketeers, Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol, Crazy Love, and Shaw, Shaw, Shaw. Other credits include Hamlet Isn't Dead, Julius Caesar, uh, Commonwealth Shakespeare Company's Apprentice performance of Henry VI Part II, and she is a proud graduate of the American Musical and Dramatic Academy. So that is our panel and uh, very excited to, to have them with us. Uh, so the production of A Midsummer Night's Dream that you all have the link to, and I'm sure uh, many of you watched or you're about to watch. So I wanted to start with Bonnie uh, and ask her if she could tell us a bit more about the inspirations for this program and the format, the streaming format, and uh, how that idea came about in the midst of, uh, of this whole last year and how, how she came up with this uh, this kind of innovative format to prevent uh, to present Shakespeare. So that's my first question for Bonnie. Hi, hi everybody. Uh, thanks, Daniel. Um, yeah, th th what, what you're going to see uh, in this video that you watch is actually a combination of two programs. One that has been in existence for 25 years uh, with the Shakespeare Theater, uh, which is called Shakespeare Live. It's basically our flagship educational touring program. And uh, for 25 years, it has brought abridged productions of Shakespeare to uh, about 700,000 students uh, in the Mid-Atlantic region. Um, we're very proud of it. Brian and I uh, invest a huge amount of time and energy and creativity into this particular program. And I think that we have essentially changed the landscape, the education landscape, in, certainly in the state of New Jersey, um, because the program was born out of a really um, angry response to the fact that there was very little Shakespeare being uh, presented to students in schools. And we kind of came up with this insanely ambitious goal of making sure that no student would graduate from high school in our state without having seen Shakespeare performed live. So, so the production that you're about to see is indeed a Shakespeare live production. It was originally um, 
uh, uh, created by Brian back in 2019. Uh, he restaged it with uh, uh, much of the same company in 2020, and then it got nipped in the bud by the pandemic. Um, that company of actors has essentially, <clears throat> excuse me, stayed with us. And so we restaged it again in 2020, uh, sorry, in 2021, just recently, we went back into rehearsal in January, um, again, with a few different actors, but, and a few different roles being cast differently. Um, but knowing that this time it would not be an in-person tour, uh, that it would have to serve as a virtual tour. And, um, and there were certainly, um, there was certainly a lot of heartbreak about the fact that we still couldn't go back into the schools and perform live for the kids. But there's also the great uh, silver lining involved, which is that we can promote this video and send it uh, globally. We can, you know, reach to, out to teachers and schools across the world and, uh, and attain a much larger reach with the program. The second program that, that, that it's combined with is this thing that we invented um, back in the, in the fall uh, called Pandemic Playhouse Entertainment, which is essentially um, a kind of a, a production company that we established within, within under, the, you know, under the auspices of the Shakespeare Theater of New Jersey, inspired very much by the, tel the television programs in the late 1950s, early 60s, um, Philco Playhouse, uh, Playhouse 90, Masterpiece Playhouse, where the whole premise of that programming was that you would take a, a group of actors, rehearse them as though it was going to be a play, and then present that play on a soundstage in Hollywood and film it. And so we've essentially done the same thing. Uh, we, we take the plays, we rehearse them, we put them on uh, uh, this, our main stage. Obviously there's no audience. So the, the, the space essentially turns into this big soundstage uh, and we film the productions for virtual viewing. So, um, it's, so it's really Shakespeare Live being disseminated through our Pandemic Playhouse Entertainment uh, platform. And um, uh, so part of it's uh, brand new and part of it's uh, very much a tr long time tradition here at the Shakespeare Theater in combination. I wanna ask you something as a follow up from that and specifically what you said about this idea of people having to see Shakespeare performed. So kind of related to this question about um, filming it, I would just love to hear more from you because obviously Shakespeare is taught in school. We read the text, a lot of people read these texts. So I'd love to hear a little bit from more from you of exactly what it is that we get from it live that we don't get from the text and why you're so passionate about that, the live performance aspect specifically with, with Shakespeare. I think when the kids see it on film, the great thing is they're gonna to get to see close-ups. And, and that's an advantage that they may not have sitting in a big school auditorium, um, you know, 50 feet away. However, when they are all together gathered in that room, and I mean, there is nothing that can replicate the excitement that ripples through a crowd of people experiencing the same thing at the same time. You know, and you know, their heartbeats start to align, their laughter is infectious, their groans and, and moans are infectious. Um, <clears throat> you see them, and, and we can watch their faces, and they feed the actors uh, a kind of energy that's just not attainable uh, once you move to some kind of video or film uh, format. And uh, it, it's that invisible chemistry between audience and artists that we miss so dearly and that I think makes the kids respond to Shakespeare in a much more visceral, deep way than they may by watching a video of it. I don't, you know, who knows? But uh, I, I don't think that any of us involved would, and again, I'm gonna speak for everybody, but if you, if you say, can you, if you wanna perform this live or do you wanna do it for film? I think most actors would prefer live. And as certainly Brian and I, I think I can speak for both of us, would really uh, can't wait to get back in front of the kids themselves and create that chemistry again. I think that's something that we obviously we all miss is that that visceral, as you said, of the connection between the audience and the actors and the actors feeding off of the audience. Um, and I think, you know, part of that also then is the educational element, right? Of seeing these scenes come to life in ways that may not make sense uh, on the page. Uh, so 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think though in this in this production, as you mentioned, the close up, um, I think that is something really fascinating. I, I'm curious of, and this is kind of an open ended question, but as you mentioned that specifically, and that's something that I guess Shakespeare could not have imagined, obviously, in his own writing. And the things that come out of the close up parts of monologues, uh, a feeling on the face, something in the eyes. I'm so curious, uh, how has that illuminated even because you have such a so much experience with Shakespeare and with these plays? How has that illuminated certain parts of it? I wonder, you know, even though we're losing the live audience, uh, are there moments or aspects that really came to life with with that close up or inspired you with that? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I, I, I certainly have my opinions about what that, you know, there's just something wonderful about suddenly getting to see uh, a, a re an actor's reaction really close up as opposed to even even 10 feet away. There's just something very different about that 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 it, that does elicit a wonderful emotion. It's just very different. It's it's a much more private kind of reaction than than one would have if one was sitting in the audience. Um, you know, I, I suppose the groundlings in Shakespeare's day got a little bit of a sense of that because they could get right up to the edge of the stage. And so, you know, if you were lucky to be right there, you would kind of get your own version of a close up. Um, but Brian, I, you know, that's probably a better question for Brian because he actually had to make some choices about whether to focus our close up shots on one character or to find a, a kind of a more thematic way to deal with close-ups. Do I, you know, do we do it every time uh, the, the actor breaks the fourth wall and addresses the audience directly? And I think he went through several ideas about how to deal with close-ups. So that might be a really great way to, to uh, pull him into this conversation because he's, um, I know he had to make a, a, a really strong decision about that because we only had so much time to do the, the you know, we did three different shoots that day uh, with different cameras and the close-up cameras we didn't have a whole lot of time with. Well, so, so Brian, I would love to ask you that. As a director, uh, what was your experience being a director of something on stage and then also being a director of a film? And how did you balance those responsibilities? How did you balance that vision? How did you balance talking to the actors uh, about about those things? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I, I think it, a lot for me has to do with the, the the great team you get to work with. So we have an amazing group of actors that we're working with. Um, Zipline Media, who did our uh, uh, filming and did all the editing afterwards. Um, uh, we have a, actually a long relationship with um, uh, two of the members of their company actually worked with us as interns when they were younger. And so we've, that we've built up that relationship. So there's a team of artists there between um, Bonnie as artistic director, the company of actors, the design team and the film team that we're all working in concert and, and trusting each other to do, um, to tell the best story. As a stage director, my job is to throw the focus to do from an audience point of view, to throw that focus to a close up, as it were, to where I want you to look at any given moment. So now in this production, I have to think, I have to make sure that Tommy who's filming and his crew are filming are looking at the right moment that have I set it up well enough for that. I trust their instincts. They've done um, uh, the Shaw 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 series with us before. Uh, they did Julius Caesar prior to this with us. So I've seen their work and I know kind of how they work. Um, Tommy and I have worked together, so he knows how I work as a director. And so we're able to kind of find a way to do that. But as Bonnie was saying earlier about kind of what language do we want to use, it's very different on film than it is in on the stage. And uh, we knew right from the beginning that we wanted the audience to feel that moment when an actor turns and looks at you specifically um, in a direct address, which works very well in the comedies. And I think it's very important in Shakespeare's comedies that you have that connection with the audience. Even though we don't have that in the theater, the actors, um, uh, we're given that opportunity with the cameramen, uh, as it were, and looking straight into the camera and having those direct address kind of close up feels for that. Um, and then add that, add to that um, a zip line, their, their team, their eye on uh, and working with us and knowing what we wanted um, as a company and as, as for me as a director, what those specific moments are that we wanted to get kind of intimate with the with the moment on stage. So when uh, Billy as uh, Hermia is distraught because her father's just said she has to be executed or marry a man she doesn't love, when she's alone with her boyfriend, that's one we definitely wanted to get much tighter on uh, for that moment because it was a much more intimate scene. Um, and but it's, it's a lot. It's a lot of trust and it's a lot of kind of knowing where we want the folks focus to be and what the scale and the scope of a particular intimate or public moment is in this play. 
Well, I think you did a fantastic job of balancing those types of things. And it was very seamless as far as when we go to a close up, it, you know, we didn't, I don't feel like it was very, like, very well integrated into the overall story. And it, again, it told the story while also still making us realize that we're watching something on stage. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm interested to also ask you as a director, because, you know, there's many famous plays, uh, you know, Doubt and Proof and many Shakespeare plays in Hamlet that have been adapted as a screenplay. And then, you know, they're filmed. Um, and of course those have close-ups and, but what you're doing here, we still understand that we're, we're feeling like we're an audience in a space. Um, so I'm, I'm so curious to hear, you know, from you as a director of how you feel about that, because while we don't have the live audience, I still think that we're kind of putting ourselves in that position when we're, when we're watching that. And so, um, you know, even as you mentioned this sort of in the comedies that certain things work with direct address. So I'd love to hear more about your, your thoughts about that as far as like filming it, but it's not a film, but then it's in the theater, but it's also not a play, yeah. you know, and that it, it works, right? I, I think it worked beautifully, but, but literally about, because I think what we wanted to talk about today was how this is kind of a new genre. Mm -hmm. So I'm just curious to hear your thoughts about this specific kind of genre. Well, thank you, uh, Daniel, and I'm so glad you enjoyed it today. Um, uh, that's great, because that's you, your response is exactly what we want from everybody, which is it feels like it's intimate and it's just for you in your own one-person theater in your room, whether it be on your computer screen, your TV screen, or your phone screen, whatever it might be. But um, uh, film and television are, 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 and, and stage are radically different art forms. Um, and they both have great merits and wonderful um, opportunities and challenges uh, that both ex exist in. For as Bonnie was mentioning earlier, we definitively did not want to become a film company. That's not who we are. We are not a film and television company. We are a theater. Um, I think we're a fantastic theater and do some amazing work with the classics and have done for, uh, for many, many decades now. Um, so we wanted to hold true to who we were as an institution and as artists. So that first and foremost is why we didn't go, hey, let's do, you know, we could go outside. We got some great woods right behind our building right here. We could do some great outdoor scenes. We could do all that stuff, but that's not what we wanted to do. We wanted to capture the essence of our art form, one that we are so passionate about and passionate about sharing with other people and keep that sense of it being a play. So in in not doing a film and not doing a play, but trying to do a film of a play. I mean, there are, it, you say it's a new art form and it is in some sense, but it has been around a bit. I mean, I grew up, my first film, my first filmed uh, theater experience was Camelot on PBS when great performances did Richard Harris doing that. And I was like, I wanna do theater the rest of my life because I've seen this stage production and I was in my living room on PBS and in a really bad TV, you know, in the 70s. We didn't have great TVs then. Um, but it, was, it transformed my view of what could happen on stage. So we were trying to get that, capture that essence. Um, I mean, with, we keep coming in these cycles. Everything old is new again. And this is, as Bonnie mentioned, the, 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 the series in the 50s, in the early 60s, we're re-upping and making it our own. But it, it's something that has existed before. We just have to make it pertinent for our time. Well, and speaking of these cycles, so, you know, I, I, I'd love to ask you also about just a play like Midsummer that so many people know well, and even audiences have seen so many times. Um, so how, how do you go about making it fresh in this sort of, it's a famous text, it's like one that, you know, we've seen, how, how do you go into it to make it fresh for your actors and for your audience like are you every time you do it thinking about some different particular aspect or i'm curious of those kinds of strategies i mean for me as an audience member i love it, it, it i always love watching it um but if you think about maybe some other audience people what do you think about new ways that you're going to grab them or even people who have seen this at your theater before maybe and i don't know if it was done 10 or 15 years ago like i'm curious how you approach that when you have this uh, really, really famous work that you want to bring to life in this this new cycle. Yeah, and I think I, I think this is a question can hit all four of us because um, uh, I've directed it numerous times. Bonnie's directed it numerous times. Uh, uh, Billy has been in this production three times. Uh, Jeffrey has been in this production twice in two different, very different roles. Um, so I think you're going to get a different answer from all of us. But um, yes, we always have to keep it fresh. But most of that is about being present in the moment. And if you get a great team of actors that are up to play these crazy situations that happen in Midsummer Night's Dream and these heartbreaking and challenging situations that happen in Midsummer Night's, Midsummer Night's Dream, then you have um, that electricity happening on stage and then it's fresh and immediate, regardless of what setting you put it in. 
That said, as a director, I like to have a fun setting and story that's kind of the, the, the framework to tell the story within. And as um, someone who oversees the education department, we do Midsummer pretty much every single year and have done it for the last 25 years. I think there's two years we haven't done Midsummer Night's Dream in the schools. And that can get pretty kind of dull and boring and nobody wants to do it. We don't work that way. We try to find new ways to, to re-up it every three or four years. Um, you get a new cast in that immediately takes whatever vision you had and re-ups it again. Uh, for this particular production, um, I was really intrigued because the world we were, we were existing in, this kind of um, midsummer opens in a very repressive, uh, these are the rules you must follow kind of society. Um, uh, you have a young woman who's told if she does not marry the man she, her father wants her to marry, she will be executed. I mean, these are very extreme situations. It's Romeo and Juliet in reverse. It starts as a tragedy and becomes this glorious fun comedy by the end. Uh, but we had to kind of establish that but also something that was gonna let us to get, get into a fun, exciting world. Um, so I started with a very Victorian based, which feels very kind of rigid. Um, you also have an era in the Victorian uh, world where women are starting to get a better, better sense of power. You've got Queen Victoria, the most kind of rule driven monarch um, uh, that England had and one of the longest reigning and most powerful. So you have this kind of power structure. Um, and then you have the silly twist on that, which is more modern, which is steampunk. Um, which is where we went with the fairy world, which is very colorful, lots of gears and gadgets and things kind of going in. So that's what we did for this particular uh, realm. But we've done, Bonnie did a beautiful production with um, umbrellas that transformed into a zillion different things and rollerblades and, and things. Um, uh, there was a production uh, on our main stage when I first started here that was all um, uh, these glorious, glamorous um, uh, bedwear, these robes and, and pajamas that were gorgeous. And so you can find different worlds to place it in, but at the core, it has to be the immediacy of the actors and what's happening in that moment, which is what Jeffrey and Billy bring to this project. That's, that's fantastic. I, I, I love that idea, as you said, of the authenticity. Um, because that definitely makes it alive. Um, though I, I am curious because just, I wanna ask you a question about genre as well, because you did mention comedies and being a member of the education department and, and you, you, know, you mentioned um, Victorian era and then you mentioned steampunk, obviously the text references Athens, uh, although it was written in the 1590s. Is, is it because it's a comedy that there's something more broad about being able to incorporate all of those things? I mean, that's it, very different from if you were doing Henry the Fourth. or I'm curious about your framework. If you approach this text, like you feel more liberty because it's a comedy or, or not, or, you know, that's, that's sort of what I'm, I'm wondering just because of all these different uh, inspirations. Yeah, I, I, and Bonnie can talk to this too, because this kind of goes to who we are as an institution. Uh, do you want to hit on this, Bonnie? Because this kind of, we were talking yeah, about this earlier. I, I so. think that I think that yes, that that a the comedies give you a little bit more latitude, but I think that Midsummer very specifically gives you a tremendous amount of room to go nuts and explore and come up with incredibly creative conceptual devices to frame the work because it's a play about magic. I mean, the whole thing from beginning to end is infused with this sense of, you know, <clears throat> the once they leave the court of, the, of Duke Theseus and get out into the woods, pretty much anything is possible. And so uh, Shakespeare kind of automatically gives you a, a, a permissive device uh, to, to go wild. And, you know, I've seen productions that, that actually go too wild because they, they do try to cram too, too much into one world. Uh, but 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 there's a pretty high. That's a pretty. You got to go really nuts to uh, to make that mistake. Um, so I think that if you've got a, 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 a if you have found a really wonderful way to segue from the world of the of the Athenian court into the world of the forest, and that there's a, a, some kind of logic that the audience can follow on that path. Once you get to the woods you are, uh, as I said, given a fair amount of latitude in, in how you want to uh, present the play, both visually, conceptually, um, uh, stylistically, in terms of how the actors portray the roles, you know, time frame wise, you can, you, can, you can put it in different time periods, but you can also transcend time and space and put it in a world that just hasn't existed yet. You can create your own world. So I, I think it's that element of magic that gives you that ultimate freedom and, and kind of liberty to do a whole lot with it. I, I love that because I feel like that answer also just explained to us why it's done 
so often and why it it is such a loved play because it does give us that that latitude right and so it's that's why I could watch it you know every year in a different production because of the jumping off point for imagination um, so at this point I, I want to then send it to the actors um, to Jeffrey and Billy so given what we've talked about with genre and given what we talked about with the form of theater and film I, I'd love to hear from each of you uh, about your characters uh, how you approached those characters and how how it's changed and about about your experience. So maybe we'll start with uh, start with Billy. So I know that's a pretty broad question, but would just love to hear about your journey um, artistically and as a human being in this past year. Uh, you know, doing doing theater. So um, it's absolutely been very interesting to do um, this production of Midsummer three times. Um, and I think speaking to what Bonnie and Brian were saying is that the world is full of magic. So there's a lot to explore constantly. And that's just the way to continue to keep it fresh is to listen and respond to everything because you're not going to get everything every single time. So there's always new things to find, always new things to hear, always new things, oh, new ways to say things. But for me, it's a wonderful opportunity to create characters that are incredibly colorful, incredibly different from the other three, because our company is quite small. So um, I had the opportunity to play Hermia, Snug, and Peas Blossom, which are, it, technically Snug and Hermia are in the same world, but in very different classes of the same world. And it's easy to, for me, it's easy to understand the basic truth of the story, which is love love is is it just incredibly present in all of the characters Hermia's love for Lysander and Snug's love for being a joiner and and for theater and you know the fairies love for their world and, and wanting to keep the world the way it is so having that center that thing to really ground you is is very easy and then you just kind of go off um and and create something that you think is truthful and interesting based on the given circumstances that you that you have snug was the was one of my favorites to create because you can be anything as far as a mechanical <laughs> all it says is that he's a little afraid a little afraid and a little um not so great at learning lines but he could really he could really be anything so it really is a fantastic and one of the best opportunities i think to find as much truth as you can in in ways that you are not able to explore all the time in, in regular life um, yeah, and, and and similarly, as Brian was saying, I, I got to do this production twice in wildly different roles. Uh, this production, I was Oberon, whereas last year's production, I was Puck. Um, and so as Oberon, who's also doubling as Duke Theseus, uh, you have these counterpoints. Both are in charge of the world that they live in, but Duke Theseus uh, is adhering to the rigidity of these laws that are in place. He says to Hermia, as much as I want to help you, there's nothing I can do. These are the stringent laws that are in place. This is what we have to follow. Whereas Oberon's kind of in a world where he doesn't follow the rules, and he makes his own rules up when he wants to. Um, and so you get the luxury of these wildly different counterpoints. Um, then going back to last year, which is Philistrate Puck. Um, for me, Puck, I got to, I, I consider myself a very physical actor. I love movement-based things. And so uh, Puck is this hobgoblin. And Brian was going the route of a satyr, which is like this half goat, half man thing. And so for me, I'm very much a fan of animal work when it comes to building characters and developing them. And so when you're already thrown that, well, he is part goat, you get to live in this world of, all right, what has happened? You get to do these bleats and mix them in with your text if you want on words. And so it, it's this wonderful flowery place where you actually get to explore what it means to you to be an artist. Um, and that's one of the things I love so much about classical theater and specifically Shakespeare is that the canon is so vast and there's so many different roles within it that are wildly different that within a year I can go from playing Puck to playing Oberon. And again, this is such a specific um, opportunity that you really don't get where you get to play the same role in the same play with the same director with the majority of the cast being the same and you end up having a completely different experience. 
So I'd love to just ask you a follow-up on that, which is you said that you're a very physical actor. So could you talk a little bit more about how that informs your search for the truth and authenticity of the character and how, how what does that mean, you know, as far as your, your body and how you find the character and uh, your, your process, I guess, being specifically that you said that you're very physical. Yeah, absolutely. Before I was an actor, I started out in my journey through the arts in dance. And so that was kind of my gateway in. Um, so like being in my body, I find things in terms of transitionally, it's a nice way for me to start my exploration. I think in terms of physicality, when it comes to character building, again, there's a whole different thought on basing characters off of animal, what animals are they most like, and kind of seeing how that informs their behavior. But also it's things like the way you walk, the way you carry your body, where your tension is held. If you hold tension in your neck or in your shoulders, what's that going to do to your character? Where are you leading from? Are you leading from your head because you're so intelligent? Are you leading from like your groin and your pelvis because you that's where your desires lie? Um, so for me, that's like the first thing I do is try to figure out where that is for the character. Um, I also love that Stanislavski has these like 100 questions that are about building a character. And so I also approach those. But then again, it's like, I, I subscribe to this idea of the actor's toolbox where you study several different methods and then you figure out which methods work best for you and kind of develop from there. Um, and, and so that is also super helpful. So there are like things for me that I really like to do is uh, I also develop a playlist for a character. Um, and like, what does this character listen to? What kind of music? And so like for Oberon, it's, it's the songs like Roxanne that's on that playlist because he's just so deeply emotional and so deep in his feelings and figuring things out. And he's so, but it's, and so it's, I think it's, it's just, it's a lot of fun to explore that artistry. After that, you get into the actual like technical aspects of learning lines and what words matter and operatives and things like that. But yeah, I, I think it's just, it's one of the best parts of being an artist is just getting to play. And similarly uh, for Billy, so with three different roles, how, how did you, you know, it, what was your experience like with that as you switched from one to the other and having those be separate in your mind? I, I'm, I'm curious. I, I, I love as an audience member when there's uh, an actor playing multiple roles. So I'd just love to hear from you of that experience. Yes. Well, there's the first a very technical part, which is the changing of the costumes, which <laughs> in the film is real time. There's a, it's what, like 15, 20 seconds, a quick change Maybe from, I think it is less, <laughs> from, um, from Hermia to Snug. So obviously the costume helps to inform where your character sits, how they hold themselves based on the way they dress, because people dress a certain way based on how they hold themselves and how, what parts of their body they would like to call attention to. Um, so that's, and like Jeffrey was saying, where they hold their tension, that's, that's one thing that is very informative for me. Um, and I'm, I'm a big fan of the, the animal um, idea as well. Where, where in the world do they fit in? So where the animal kingdom has very vast um, life of its own. So where, where do your characters fit in in that world? The fairy was very easy. Obviously, there were bugs. <laughs> they were very a uh, stick like um clicky bugs so that was that was a pretty easy thing to click into just based on the sounds that they make and um snug was a little dog snug was a little puppy so there was a lot of things i could do um that would easily help me translate how snug thought or how he responded to people speaking to him like uh, dogs often do the head tilt when they listen so Snug does that a lot when he's when he's listening to process and just to, for, for him to process, be able to process that someone is speaking to him. And so the audience understands that he's heard it, but maybe doesn't quite know how to respond or understand <laughs> yeah. what they said. And that is for me the fastest way to kind of click in to that character. But the given circumstances before every scene, if I have time um, during the quick change is to remind myself who I am literally who I am <laughs> and what do I think I am walking into? What do I expect to happen when I get in there? And who do I expect to, if anybody, who do I expect to be there? And that, that definitely helps um, because we always have an expectation and that also helps you listen. The expectation is far different <laughs> than what, than what, um, when, what comes out. I, you know, I, I love that because just hearing you talk about it then explains to me I think why I love watching it so much because I, you know, I think we can feel that sense of freedom and creativity in everything that you're saying, which 
which is really which is really wonderful. Um, and I I'm curious also if, you know just from both of you to hear a little bit more specifically and on this idea of of multiple characters and and the freedom of how how do you feel you know maybe in in your body or your interpretation of these differences between Athens and the fairy world and then the world of the actors which is sort of uh, I don't know if it's realistic or not, or they, you know what I mean? So I, I'm curious how that trend, those transitions in the sense of genre um, might feel to you as, as actors in this, in this one play. Sure, um, I, I fortunately have an easier time in terms of the transition than Billy does. I, in this production, I play Duke Theseus and I play Oberon. And I start the opening scene as Duke Theseus, and then I turn into Oberon, and then I am Oberon for 90% of the show, and then I turn back into Duke Theseus. So fortunately, there's not a lot of back and forth. Um, that being said, one of the things that's super helpful is, again, physically what's happening in terms of the differences between my characters is Oberon is Jeffrey in a black, wonderful jacket and these boots, and then Oberon throws on a pair of 18-inch jumping stilts. Um, and so I am physically a foot and a half taller than I already am. I have the staff that I'm walk um, walking around with, the robe that I'm wearing, the coat that I'm wearing in order for it to fit as Oberon does not fit Jeffrey. And so I physically have, like I have an actual physical transformation that I'm able to latch onto that then brings me into the world, um, which then helps actor Jeffrey uh, realize where he is and where he's going. and what his given circumstances are, how I'm coming into the scene and what I'm dealing with. And then similarly, uh, there's not necessarily a quick change, it's just a lot of things that come off and a lot of things that go back on. And then I re-enter as Theseus uh, walking through the woods and I spot these children. And so it, it's very, I think I have an easier job um, in terms of making those switches and those connections as a character because they are so almost linear um, based on the way that it's been cut and adjusted. So that's been super helpful. I think um, for me, it's, I'm fortunate, fortunate for me, unfortunate for the characters that everyone starts in a, in a not high place, but in a sort of medium emotional state. And it quickly, everyone ends in a quite a bit of distress by the middle of the play. So every, <laughs> there's a lot of high, high intensity for, for every, every character, um, except maybe Pea Blossom. Pea Blossom, <laughs> Pea Blossom Kent is a little stressed, but it's, you know, got a little more room to navigate the world. But what I, what I mentioned before um, about the play in its essence, just being about love, for me, it's, 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 it's an easy thing for me to remind myself of what the character loves. And in this time, how much of their love are they allowed to express? Because you hold that in different places in your body and you have more allowance to be physical with love in certain relationships, depending on who you're speaking to, depending on where you are, depending on the time of day. You know, there are so many things that this very basic emotion, and there are so many ways it can inhabit your body based on if you are allowed to truly express it. So Hermia has very small moments where she's allowed to truly express it to Lysander when they're alone or think they're alone. <laughs> and Snug is, has too much fear. What is, what is, you know, what is that like to have too much fear to express the love that you have for this thing, for the theater, but you have too much fear. So it's just reminding myself of how much love I have, but how much am, am I in this moment allowed to express? And that, for me, that really changes um, how my body moves. That's, that's an incredibly beautiful answer. So <laughs> thank you so much that, that, I mean, I think just thinking about that as a, as a theme for the play again, um, makes it, makes it also how we, we can see how it's a very perennial kind of thing of people with love and fear and all of that. Um, I want to, I want to like sort of pivot a little bit back to, to Brian and his direction um, and kind of off of this, uh, I'm curious just from, you know, and again, because this is filmed and on stage, you know, one of the things I, I really loved about watching this uh, is really the, the pacing was fantastic um, and thinking about the comedy element. So I'd love to hear um, from Brian to sort of, along with pacing, how you also addressed um, 
you know, some of the cuts in the text. So making this an hour and 13 minutes, I think it was, uh, and how you went about that, because I, I mean, I, I thought it, it really sort of breezes by it's, uh, in the best possible way of, of a comedy and keeping it funny and keeping all the, you know, the beats going. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about that part of the process. Well, I'll start with that, with the, with the, with the trimming of the script. So um, uh, we get asked frequently about who, who does the trimming of the scripts for us? Because uh, some companies will have an outside dramaturg, uh, dr dr dramaturgical people do that. Um, that's done by the directors at our theaters with the guidance of the full artistic team and education team here. Um, the Midsummer script, um, uh, it, it finesses a little bit, but we we trimmed this down, and it's it kind of holds to um, what we've what we trimmed in the past. It, what's exciting about it is Shakespeare wrote Shakespeare wrote to be heard and and presented live in the in the universe, not to be just sit sit down and read it. And that's nothing against the reading of it. I love reading Shakespeare. I'm actually teaching a class in another hour and a half about reading Shakespeare tonight. Um, so it's something I, I adore. But for the for the audiences, it's about having the words out in the universe. Because he was performing at an outdoor venue, I mean, it's an enclosed outdoor venue in the Globe Theater. And he had a lot of things going on in the theater. They were selling oranges during the show. There were pickpockets. There's a bunch of stuff going on. There's a lot of things get repeated over and over and over and over again. So right off the bat, we can trim a lot of stuff out because it's been said 17 times. We can do some other things like um, uh, for the filming um, and for our productions on the main stage, we will have lighting effects and sound effects that will tell you, oh, it's dark, it's night time out now. So we don't have to say it's night 17 times in the scene. We can say it once and the audience is with us. So that's just, those are some immediate easy trims that we'll have right off the bat. But when we're going into the play, one thing institu institutionally that we're most passionate about is making sure we're keeping the heart and the intention of this amazing playwright and this amazing um, uh, human detective, uh, kind of being able to see inside humanity. And we want to keep that, 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 that the essence of his work still true and honest. So that's kind of our kind of guiding posts, um, trim repetition, keep the heart, keep the great, amazing, beautiful poetry um, and go from there. We are touring into schools a lot of times and we have to cut down to anywhere from an hour to 75 minutes, um, which is painful <laughs> a lot. Um, but um, it just means we have to dive in, as Billy and Jeffrey both said, full force into every single scene. So when uh, I'm working with actors and when they're entering a scene, they know exactly what's happening. As I, J Billy beautifully said about their expectations, what do you expect to happen when you come into a scene? And then what happens when that expectation is not met? That to me is the key to the comedy. Um, it's a key to also, you asked in the beginning of this, how do you keep it fresh? is keeping that expectation fresh every single time. I'm gonna go in here and I'm gonna get the role that I want. I, you know, Isaac, uh, who plays um, uh, flute, uh, is disappointed in the role he's originally cast in. He's expecting to play this great knight. So he's got to go in 100% every time going, I'm gonna play a great knight. What do you mean I'm gonna play a girl? Like that, that, and that reversal in the moment, that expectation and the crashed expectation is what keeps the uh, tempo alive, the buoyancy of the play alive, the heart of the play alive, and, the, and all of that together. I, well, you know, I, I have to say that the sort of life and the vibrance that you bring to it is is really wonderful. I mean, it it and and in all of that, I I uh, I think it's really it's really commendable. And I I'm curious, you know, if you would say, you know, we're talking about the heart, and it came up a couple of times. Uh, you know, is there something that you particularly see as like the message of this play or the this production, or that you wanted to come out through this production of it, or you felt it came out of this production in a in a in a new way? There are so many things that this play says um, on so many levels. And for me, I mean, Billy talked about the, the love that's kind of at the core for her. And I think that's absolutely true. It's certainly an element of this play that's, that's, that's um, uh, one of the reasons why it's been so popular for over 400 years. Um, but there's also for me, the transformation is important in this play. That we go, everyone goes in the woods with one thing on their mind or where they're going and they they are completely transformed when they go through the woods uh helena is obsessed to the point of um uh, well <laughs> some serious damage to herself um with her obsession with with demetrius and in the woods she sees what that feels like to receive that 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 obsessive love that over uh, over doting that, that is talked about so often in the play she receives it from two sources lysander and demetrius when they're spelled and she hates it and suddenly she has a revelation 
Um, Hermia, who gets everything she wants in the play until daddy won't let her marry the man she wants to marry, suddenly gets, sees what happens when she does lose everything. Um, when, when Lysander, who is everything to her, she gives up her entire world to go be with this man she loves. When he rejects her because of a spell that Puck thinks is funny, um, casts on her, um, then she's transformed. She becomes a different person at the end of the play. Um, so I, I think it, it, Bottom's the obvious choice. You know, he goes in as a bit of a braggart, come, becomes an ass that he sort of was to begin with, and then becomes... Uh, 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 realizes kind of what he really was dreaming for was not the the prestige, but the art in the, in my mind. And it becomes a whole different um, experience. But for me, it's about the transformation and the possibility for all of us to transform into better, wonderful human beings in the end. I mean, they're the worst actors in the world, the, 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 the mechanicals are. And they come out at the end, you're like, oh, you're so bad, but I just love you so much for doing and doing something you're scared of or, or, or dream of doing. But we're all, that transformation, the possibility in all of us, I think is important. That's, that's wonderful. I mean, that, that is, that's a beautiful message, I think, of transformation. And that is one that speaks to everybody who's watching it. So that's, yeah, even just hearing you talk about it, it's so... It's so great to the, the sort of enthusiasm, and I can feel that in the work and in the play and in the characters and how they also have that sort of vibrant life. So it's 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 really it's really cool. Um, I wanted to. We have a few questions from the audience um, as I look at my chat here. Um, so uh, this question: uh, Do your young audiences get help with the language before they see the show? Uh, Elizabethan language is very confusing and very often delivered quickly. So on that question of pacing, um, so as far as education, uh, do you do, how, how do you, do you sort of preempt some of your audiences? Is there any, um, I guess, age-wise that might be different, but that was one of our questions. Uh, I'm going to let Billy and Jeffrey address this because they, they deal with this in the classrooms and in the, in the venues. But just so you know, when we go out to the schools, we do present they get a study guide in advance, which sometimes teachers use in advance. A lot of them use, will use afterwards. Um, but uh, do, uh, Billy and Jeffrey, do you wanna talk about how the students reacted language versus the adults? Yes. Um, well, when we are touring to students, um, coming to them to their schools, a lot of them, depending on the age group, middle school, high school, usually, are in the middle of reading the play in their classrooms a lot of the time, especially something like Midsummer that is fortunately still um, widely read in classrooms or at least discussed. So a lot of them have either read the entire play before or have at least been introduced to the story. But one of the main things that Shakespeare Live really focuses on is clarity of language and making sure that we are understanding exactly what we are saying so that they are understanding exactly what we are saying. And we and um, the Shakespeare Theater are very much believers that anyone can understand Shakespeare, that there's a lot of it that is rooted today still in truth, and so that anyone can understand it as long as you give them the opportunity and show them that they can and welcome them into the space. It's amazing how much the students understand. Even We've even been to a few elementary schools with Midsummer, um, and you know, I, I think there's always that little bit of, of fear that, oh, they won't enjoy it because maybe they were too afraid. Maybe they didn't understand. But just the reactions that you get tell you that they are exactly on the right page with you. And it's, and it's really wonderful just to be able to bring something like this into, a, into a schools with students and understanding and feeling that they understand because you believe in them enough to understand and that you put such a heavy focus on clarity. And we also when we are in the school, some schools um, are able to purchase workshops. So we go into classrooms and do um, textual um, exercises with them, acting exercises to help them break down the text and, and teach them about operative words and about um, antithesis and about ladders and all those kinds of things. So we do some of that extra as well, but um, a big thing that we focus on is, is clarity and making sure that they feel welcomed and a part of the experience so that they feel that they already can understand as well. I, I think that's really wonderful because what I what I hear from that also is this the necessity of live theater and how that in itself is educational of bringing this text to life. Um, I'm curious like from both of you too, like if, do you find like, uh, do you sometimes like these younger audiences better or the same or they just sort of hear different things? I mean, I know from my experience, like sometimes the, 
when they're paying attention, obviously, uh, they they can maybe be a better audience or, or how you feel about that. I, I personally love performing for a younger audience. Um, I think it's it's the thing is they are wonderful, but they will probably be your tougher your toughest critics. They are honest. They are it's it's one of those things where they haven't necessarily been molded by humanity about like the way you're supposed to respond to things. And so they're just being completely authentic and truthful. So if it's funny, you will get some of your biggest and best laughs from them. But also like if you're not funny, if you 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 might fall. You might fall on your face and it is okay. But I think that's like it, it there's so much more risk when you're performing with them. And it, it's it's beautiful in my opinion, because again, it's you know they're not laughing to make you feel good. They're laughing because they found it genuinely funny. And there's nothing, I don't think there's a greater reward as an actor on stage than getting a genuine response, whether that's complete laughter, whether it's heartbreak, whether it's pain, whether it's hurt. It's it the fact that it's with them, you know it's genuine is something I wouldn't trade for anything. It's wonderful. Well, I think that speaks to the the strength of Shakespeare's writing and also the strength and truth of your performances that you're that you're getting such a great reaction out of the out of the toughest possible audiences. So that's uh that's really wonderful. I mean that's that's the true accomplishment, right? Is for <laughs> for them to understand and to also appreciate. So um, I, yeah, so so what what is next for uh, for the Shakespeare Theater? What's next for this production? Uh, and you mentioned like live performance, so maybe to hear from from Bonnie about the the future, um, what's going to be happening, uh, the, the bright future we're all looking forward to of coming back. Yes, yes, very much. Can't wait. Um, in the meantime, however, um, we are going to be performing both A Midsummer Night's Dream and Julius Caesar at a, a, what we call the Backyard Stage, which is a very special venue that we literally built from scratch last year uh, to be um, designed to be pandemic safe. And so we will start live performances of our two Shakespeare uh, live productions uh, through the end of April into the beginning of May. And at that point, um, and, uh, and uh, at that point, we will also probably be going into rehearsal for yet another backyard stage show, which is yet to be announced. Uh, we're probably going to do um, a show for young people very specifically, as well as uh, another adult show. We're probably going to have a few live concerts out there again this summer. And we're hoping to be able to get back to what we call the outdoor stage, which is uh, an extraordinarily beautiful Greek stone and grass Greek amphitheater that we use every summer um, on a nearby college campus. And we will hopefully be doing a, a fairly large Shakespeare production out there this summer. Um, and then we're and we're going to continue to produce uh, more shows for uh, Pandemic Playhouse Entertainment on on film, and we're hoping to get back to our main stage and live performances in the sometime in the fall or early winter. So yeah, there's a lot on our plate right now, and hoping That's, we uh, do it. Yeah, hoping we can do it all. Yeah, that's incredible. And then as far as like, um, you know, educational, like, so just tell our, our audience a little bit about, I know, Brian, you mentioned you're teaching a class. Um, mm -hmm. I know you do sort of, yeah, so be curious just to hear about that as well for everyone who's watching. Well, in addition to the artwork we present on the stages that we have um, whenever we're able to uh, and into schools and um, different community centers, uh, our education programs include right now uh, uh, our popular Shakespeare book club, um, which is actually not just Shakespeare book club. We do a lot of things with that. Um, we just finished a Tennessee Williams book club, which Bonnie uh, ran. I'm teaching um, uh, Playboy, uh, Playboy Prince to Hero King, which is Shakespeare's Henry V right now. Um, we will have another program, which we're putting the final touches on this summer, uh, which is a virtual um, uh, uh, salon uh, where Bonnie and uh, artists associated with the company will have dialogues and people can kind of sneak in to find out what goes on to create the work that we do on a regular basis. And then in the fall, we'll be presenting um, a, a virtual book club um, based on Hamlet and beyond. So it'll be Hamlet and then things that have been inspired by Hamlet. Uh, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead by Stoppard. Um, Updike's um, Gertrude and, 
Gertrude and Claudius. Um, there's a, some great poems uh, by numerous artists, but including Margaret Atwood, that is oh, amazing. So it'll be kind of a deeper dive into Hamlet, but not just Hamlet. So we've got a lot of things that are working in the education department as well. And hopefully um, gearing up for our 2022 in-school live performances back on stage with Shakespeare Live. Wow, you, you you're yeah. very busy. I think it's yeah. <laughs> it's it's very in, it's very inspiring. Um, I think that's that's wonderful. Um, so yeah, so so thank you so much um, to Bonnie and Brian and Jeffrey and Billy for telling us so much about this production and your process and the Shakespeare Theater and um, you know and just encouraging everyone whether they've watched it or they're about to watch Midsummer. Uh, it's a really fantastic production. It's beautifully filmed. Uh, it's funny. It has the heart. It has the love in it. So um, just encouraging everyone watching this to sign up, to subscribe, to enjoy theater in the ways that we can do it now, and to look forward to enjoying it all together again uh, this summer and this fall. So again, Thank you so much, everybody, for being here and for sharing so much uh, knowledge and inspiration about all of it. I, I feel excited to, to see and hear and, and read all of it coming up. So, so thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having all of us. We're really, really thrilled to be here and talk about what we've been doing. Thank you. Thank you, Patty. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Columbia. So, all right. Thank you. We'll see you soon, I hope. Yeah. All right. Thanks, everyone.